the forest and about the trees and you know just anything anything that you guys can contribute this is going to be a informal open discussion uh you know we'll walk through and we'll look at different trees and uh and even ecology of it too you know we're we're looking at uh howdy tom we're just looking at uh you know it's gonna be well let's look at let's look at some of these clues here i i uh, wrote down some of the tree id clues so you got two two pieces. One's a common species list for around here, uh, and the other one is tree ID clues. So topographic position. That's you know that's we're going to start basically from the biggest, big, largest scale to the smallest scale. Topographic position. Where are we on the landscape? Are we up up in the top of the bluff, down in the river bottoms, somewhere in the middle, a little bench on the landscape because that's going to dictate what kind of soil types you have, soil moisture, which is a, a big factor on what kind of species will be growing there, and sunlight too. You're, you're on a north slope, doesn't get as much sun, it's going to be a lot, you know, a lot more moist. Um, your trees usually grow larger there. Um, you don't have uh, the invasive species a lot of times on your north slope. They're the last place to get your invasives just because uh, sunlight, you know. So, so where are we at on the landscape? And then the second of all, species association, you know, so you got a lot of a lot of different species that are associated with other species. Oak hickory, um, bald cypress and uh, um, black gum, swamp, you know, those are swamp species, uh, maple beech forest. So you've got these species associations going on. And so you're all, you know, I'm always looking at that when you walk into a forest. Okay. You got this species, let's look around and see. A lot of times it's a big mix, don't get me wrong, but, but you know, an undisturbed forest, you'll have, that, that species association will be stronger in an undisturbed forest. Where you go to a, like a strip mine or something, I'm always amazed when I find myself in a strip mine, you know, overgrown strip mine, because your species association, you might as well throw it out the window. You'll have plants growing together that you never see growing together out in the wild, you know, and it's just, it's always intriguing, you know, how in the heck did that end up there, along with that, along with your invasives too, you know, so uh, a lot of times you'll have a species come in and either fix the soil with nitrogen or create a condition where it'll thrive for, you know, decades or longer, and then it'll, you know, be so successful it'll actually start to decline and another species will come in move in after it you know so you see that uh you know and, and that's kind of how you can also see an old pasture you walk see. in it hadn't been you know it hadn't been cattle or grazed for 15 20 years and you'll just start seeing you know locusts come in first and then you'll start seeing cherry and and black walnut and you know and box elder and so there's a lot to be said, you know, these are all things uh, how to figure out what kind of tree a particular. A lot of times I'll use these type clues over, you know, hey, let's look at the bud or, you know, the actual tree itself. Um, tree position, you know, where, where is it at in the forest? You know, if it's a dogwood, it's not going to be an overstory tree, most likely, you know. So once you start getting a handle on the size of the trees and where they typically are, um, you know, in a forest setting, you know, you can start weeding some out, you know, um, tree form, you know, your branch structure. We'll be looking at that size of your twigs, size of your branches, you know, how they're, uh, you know, what that form of that tree is. And that can vary wide, widely. A, a tree grown in a tightly spaced forest, you know, it's going to be very thin and very straight where, you know, if the same tree was growing out here on a field edge, it would be much more open growing. So all this stuff are just clues. Um, and then, you know, when you actually get to the tree, then, you know, looking at those characteristics, uh, bark, twigs, your buds, um, and then, you know, you're kicking the ground a lot. Okay, let's see, I think this is a pecan tree. There's got to be some pecans around here, you know, and you're working up the soil and just seeing what you, what you find. Uh, and then also just looking down there for leaves. Okay, yep, sure enough, there's a swamp white, you know, so, so. Pretty much, these are the character. I just jotted these down, but these are what came to mind quickly. Um, it's been 25 years since I had tree ID, so getting into the, the technical terms of the buds and looking at that, I looked at some notes. I dug them out. They, I still had them. I dug them out. I looked at that. I said, well, 
throw that to the side. We don't have time for that today, first of all, but, uh, but you know, as this will give you an overview, an idea, and then as you need to, I think Joanne actually brought a tree ID book, um, so, you know, if there's any particular tree we need to ID, um, but we are at a spot right now, it's pretty unique, uh, you know, we're in the Mississippi River bottoms, it converges with a minor stream bottom that comes up out of the bluff. Um, you know, the stream is ephemeral, it, it flows when it's wet enough and when it's dry, it dries up. But uh, as we hike up out of here, we'll go into the woods there and we'll look at some stuff uh, along the way. But once we get to the bottom of the trailhead that leads up the bluff, you know, I, I just hiked it a while ago. I'd you know, been up here many times, but I just want to do a little scouting. But there's a real marked difference as we leave and start climbing in that elevation. Uh, as we get about halfway up, we'll really pick up on, you know, the oak and hickory and some of your drier species who are on the way there. You know, we get a lot of a sycamore and, and maple and a lot of your, your bottom one species. So feel free as we're walking to ask questions, point something out. Uh, you know, I really don't a box elder right there. That's a box elder. You can't kill those things. They're hard to kill. They're junk. Yeah, uh, I didn't hear what you said. What is that? Box elders. Box elders, yeah. Elder. yeah. I they, hate them. Yeah, uh, they're prolific. They're prolific. A lot of times in a bottomland hardwood forest, they'll really take over. And, you know, at forestry practice, you're thinning a lot of them. Uh, you know, they're, they're a less desirable tree. When I say junk, just, you know, you can correct me. I don't mean I hate that tree or anything like that. But as a desirable species on your property, I mean, it's a box elder. Yeah, it is habitat. Uh, you know, it does produce, uh, you know, some catkins basically, but it does produce, uh, you know, forage for wildlife. But it is a prolific tree. It'll it'll take over. So, so on that note, let's uh, let's take a walk. <laughs> oh, oh, you look great. There. It is kind of a scrappy. Nice. Scrappy mess, yeah. You know, a relatively ugly tree. Um, you can always tell a box elder by its green twigs. Mm -hmm. You know, you'll see uh, sassafras has that also, but uh, if, if you're in doubt, box elder, they like good fertile soil. They're down in the bottom winds a lot of times. Uh, very shade tolerant. They'll grow underneath a bottomland hardwood forest and slowly proliferate and before you realize it you got a boxwood forest with just a few you know desirable trees here and there so they are native though right they are native yeah they're just kind of a nuisance <laughs> nuisance that's right yeah so yeah i think most of that species are ash but yeah. not totally but overall <laughs> that's an ash and if like on your property you say they're dying yeah that's a, yeah, yeah, sure. yep yeah and actually they'll, they've been dying for other uh, Disease called ash yellows. They've been calling or dying before the ash borers really? has even gotten here. Yeah. So, yeah, and you know it's a shame. There's some real nice stands of ash around. Mm -hmm. You know, just massive, actually, big trees. Is the white ash more detailed, the bark, than the green? Usually, or the only way green? I can really tell is by looking at the buds. You know, where the buds so sit close. on that. Oh, yeah, climb up there close. and look at the buds. <laughs> <laughs> and he can do we it. Can, uh, I can bring a chainsaw and drop it. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> so one thing, actually, which I should have stressed earlier, uh, I've done plenty of hazard tree cutting in my lifetime. And, you know, as, as we enter the woods, always be looking up because you just yeah. never know when there's just this dead branch hanging there. I mean, people get wiped out pretty easily um, by, doesn't take big branch at all. So crazy. yeah, yeah. So, you know, on a, I couldn't tell you how many times over the years you'd be working in the woods and just hear a big one come down yeah. in close <laughs> proximity. Or I remember one time I was marking a timber sale and it was windy. There was 30 mile hour winds coming out of the Southwest and and that, that actually continued for a few days, but I'd go in there and I'd mark timber and, you know, I parked and I was like, yeah, I don't know if I like that. And sure enough, my truck didn't get hit, but 
trees were crashing everywhere and and I knew it was time to go when the top a big old top of a tree just snapped off and landed you know I mean and this stuff happens I mean I can't make this stuff up it happens so so be aware when you're in the forest that's probably your number one hazard is is a limb falling from above or even trees just coming down they'll come down so you know keep that in mind um, awareness yeah and it most likely is a cottonwood i mean without climbing up there looking at buds and stuff you, you don't know uh, but when you look up there a little little closer i mean most of you familiar with cottonwood you know look at that look at that twig structure up there there's something about this tree that doesn't look like a cottonwood you know as you look up there um in my mind the, the trunk certainly does. The trunk looks like a cottonwood. But, you know, I wouldn't, you, you know, and that's one of the things, like, you know, you, you look at some of those clues, okay, we're down here, cottonwoods do like this, you know, this type of area at the bottom one. Um, you know, so without actually being able to look at buds and stuff like that, you, you really don't know with 100% certainty. Overall, I'd say cottonwood, but as I look up there, there's something about that tree that it would not surprise me if I was wrong, if it's not a cottonwood. What other yeah. could it be? You know, um, it's not a, uh, so black walnut, I mean, that's a big one, but they can look like that. Um, and actually even sassafras, when sassafras get extremely large, which that would be probably the biggest sassafras, sassafras I've ever seen, if it is. But there's one... You know, I've cut sassafras where a two-foot bar wouldn't go through it, so it's not, you know, it's not impossible. Overall, cottonwood is what I'd say, but, you know, I'm not, I, I can also say I'm not 100% certain, you know, um, so. So, and that's, you know, that's how I operate when I'm out there. If I was doing inventory or something like that, I would put cottonwood, but if you really, really had to know, you'd take a note and say, Oh, well, there you go. Lots of them here. Oh, okay. Lots good, good. Right? Yep, and that's good, Mike. You, you nailed it. I mean, look on the ground. That's correct. Well, and here you go. Here they are. This one, what you had on the sycamore there. There's cottonwood oh, right sorry. there. Yeah. yeah. So, there you go. So, use those clues. Without <laughs> being out here in the summertime, being able to look at the buds, you're using every clue you have, including smelling them. So, yeah. In tree ID, it was pretty fun. We had a class probably this size, you know, a long time ago in college. But uh, our, you know, the grad students were teaching the class, and we'd go out there, and, you know, you'd have your pocket knife, and you'd be shaving, you know, the twigs and, and smelling it and using every sense, tasting it. And I just remember it was, our, it was a final. It was one of the final classes, and poison ivy, okay? <laughs> This guy, this guy, nobody, nobody shut him down, which I did. We should have, somebody shut him. But he was just, you know, scratching away on that oh. and just smelling it and sniffing it. Oh, yeah, and, and I don't, you know, I don't know if he, how bad he got it or anything. He buried him. What are you talking about? <laughs> oh, no. But what did I'm saying pass? is, you'll use all your senses. Think that would be a fail. You, you know, right. I <laughs> Equal opportunists, you'll find it at the top of the bluff, down on the bottoms, you'll find them everywhere. Um, they're very prolific a lot of times. You know, you do have the Dutch elm disease and it has wiped out a lot of the big ones. They seem to, you know, from what I've been told and, and uh, the research I've seen, you know, they'll persist, they'll regenerate. In fact, they'll be, you'll have an oak forest and you'll have a whole forest floor full of elm, but they, they get to some point, you know, a lot of them not much bigger than this, and they just start to peter out. They just start dying out. So they're still on the landscape. There's still plenty of them around. You don't see them get big as often as they used to. I think the Dutch elm disease gets them. But basically, I was told that they can basically outgrow, you know, live with the Dutch elm disease until you get to a point, you know, where, where it does succumb to it. So, you know, uh, an elm tree on a nice site with... Plenty of space, plenty of moisture, good soils. It'll grow strong, and it might, you know, might live a long time and get pretty big. Um, but and, and kind of the same thing, timber stain improvement thinning. You're cutting those elm. You know, a lot of elm, hackberry, sassafras. 
you know, those are your primary species around here that you're starting to weed out, but you can look. There's a little one right here. Here's another one. There's one. <coughs> and it's kind of like that in a lot of times in your forest. You look and it's like, holy cow, there's thousands, thousands of them, you know. So, and another ash tree there behind you, I think. Yep, that's right. Yeah, yeah, green ash, and uh, pretty typical, and they make good, you know, they're good lumber trees, you know, but they are dying out. Enter up here, you know, if you if you paid attention, you can start seeing we're starting to make some changes. Uh, we started picking up some ash trees. Here's one right behind us. So we're leaving that box elder sycamore area and as we come we start picking up some ash now we're starting to climb just a little bit and look at this we're picking up now we're, now we got sugar maple uh, so we're making this subtle uh, species transition but you know i just wanted to point out what you know sugar maple it um, it is very shade tolerant it'll grow underneath your oak hickory forest for decades uh, and if undisturbed, it'll grow right up to the bottom of your oak trees and just hang out until those trees die and there's a, a, you know, a gap, a canopy gap. Um, oak hickory restoration for, for years, the first thing we'd do is come in and cut all the maple out. You know, along with a lot of the other species, the, the hackberry, the sassafras, some box elder. But maple is one, you know, it, it, it'll, you know, a, a maple forest and a oak forest are mutually exclusive. They pretty much can't, you know, exist together as far as regenerate. Now, having said that, so, so the textbook example would be to come into a forest, thin all that out, you know, do any spraying on invasive afterwards, start burning it, and you're trying to capture, you know, your acorn and hickory. And just create a seed bed. You know, you're trying to mimic nature, or mimic um, mimic fire that that uh, you know for thousands of years burned freely up until about a hundred years ago. So you're trying to mimic natural fire regime, um, and you know, to some disturbance to some degree. You know, grazing actually can be beneficial if it's done properly. But here's the scenario with this, and foresters will go round and round. My personal experience is with all our oaks dying off, um, I won't go into a forest like I did 20 years ago and just start dropping maple. Um, and here's why, because you get to that point, you, you thin that forest down to this level where it, you know, it's like a park setting and it's gotta be open, you know, that, it's gotta be that open so that way some like it's on the forest floor and you can, you can get you know, some acorn germination and stuff. However, you got invasive species, they love any canopy, they love openings, right? Bush honeysuckle and, and, and multiple different invasive species. Um, and then you got your maples and stuff where, where uh, you thin them out and trying to get oak, but now we've got a lot of oak flashing out, a lot of oak are dying, you know, white oak and red oak species. So, so you take this risk of, hey, we got this mature oak forest, it's on its way out. It's not regenerating. If you look underneath, and especially if you do an inventory and you graph this, if you do an inventory around here and graph it out, you usually see the same thing. Your oaks are making up the larger diameter trees of a stand. Everything underneath it up to 12, 14 inches is usually a non-oak species. And if you just take time and push it off the graph, you're gonna see that your oak and hickory are quickly becoming a non-dominant species. This still persists, but much level, you know, a, a much lower level as far as the composition, species composition goes. So, what's the next best thing? It is sugar maple, it's a native, it's got a good lumber value, it's a pretty decent wood. A lot of times, not exactly in this case, these grapevines got this little stand here and they're really pulling it down. But a lot of times that sugar maple is straight as an arrow. So given the resource as a land manager, almost no matter who you work for, you know, you're, you can't touch every acre like you want. So 
some of the strategies are just identify those areas that are really oak prone to regenerate. You know, these nice white oak stands, dry sites, you can regenerate. You can focus your concentration to get success on smaller acreages on good sites. And then overall, you might, and where I'm at these days is if I got a good stand of maple and it's underneath a dying oak stand, I'm, I, you know, I'm apt to keep it, you know. Um, and you've got to weigh that stuff out, but it takes a lot of time and energy to regenerate oak. You could be at it 20 years and not get what you want. Uh, invasive species and... And, you know, at the same time, you're losing, when those oaks die out, you're, you're losing your seed crop. So it's a big thing. There's, uh, you know, there a lot of people studying this because from the East Coast to the prairie, it's the same thing happening. And they're finding out, I, I read a pretty decent study, you know, they've been doing these forest inventories for 20, 30 years. And there's only two places that oaks are basically holding their own. The hickories are doing a little bit better, but oaks. You got a spot in the Ozark Mountains, and you got a spot over in um, southern Appalachia, which are very similar conditions to the Ozarks. Just these dry, rocky, harsh sites where, you know, the oaks are still got the competitive advantage. But, uh, you know, it's, it's changing. The whole thing's changing, and people don't, people don't see it because it's so, you know, it's such a gradual change. Um, loggers see it. You know, I have discussions pretty often with some of my buddies that make a living in the woods and and uh you know the the you know they're all after of course white oak walnut some of your higher grade you know timber but they see it you know hey it's not regenerating it's not coming back like it was so what does that mean for uh you know for the greater economy or for folks in general they probably won't notice it until you know, whiskey barrel, wine barrels, um, high quality. You know, you're not going to notice it right away. But eventually, when you want something that needs to be made out of hardwood, that's when you'll notice it. You have to pay for it, you know. Um, and yet there's other things that happen in the southeast and stuff. They started replanting, doing some real, you know, intensive forest management. So in time, I think that, uh, that you're going to see more of that. People are going to realize, hey, you know, we've got this land. It is forest land. Let's reinvest some of that time and energy into it. You know, that's that's what I'm hoping because otherwise, you know, you, you can drive around and you can see what, you know, what a, a state of condition our forests are in. They're pretty, pretty degraded a lot of times. <coughs> but if you look at this, <coughs> I mean, those grapevines, you know, there's actually a, a timber stand improvement it can be as simple as coming through your forest and just cutting grapevines, you know, nothing else. You know, and in a case like this, that's, that's what I'd do here. Um, if you said, ah, those are maple, and you just cut everything, cut the grapevines, cut those maple out, you'd have a big patch here. You'd have bush honeysuckle coming in next year, mm -hmm. you know. So it's just, you got to weigh all this stuff out, how much time and energy you want to put in it, um, what kind of site is it, what can I get out of it, and, and you know, run with this. So it's interesting. All yeah. Interestingly, when we had the tornado, most of the trees that came down were oaks. Yeah, it's because they were mature and, and they probably had root rot. You know, so and that's another factor. A lot of your, you know, even a safety factor. A lot of your big trees. You see one right up there. That one have been dead a little bit, but uh, you'll see these big trees blown over, and you look, and they don't even have any roots. You know, they had that. They've been dead. Not dead, but you know, alive enough to stay alive above ground, but have root rot, and they just, you know, there's no no holding capacity there. So, yeah, you see it a lot, especially after storm events. So, well, we're gonna take a transition here, and I see some white oak. We're starting to pick up on some oaks as we climb up. So we'll uh, we'll hit some stuff up the trail, and then take a little break there at Madeline's Rest, and then we'll continue on and. You know, if anybody needs to go or any questions, you know, just feel free to speak freely. So, really familiar with the sassafras. See this one right here? It's got pretty deep, you know, deep uh, ridges on the bark, furled bark. Um, in fact, is he dead? He's probably close mm -hmm. to dead. Yeah. But uh, we'll find some other examples, but I just wanted to point him out. Um, yeah, I think up here I saw a couple of good examples. 
Yeah, usually when they're going out, they'll send up shoots out of the root system. So a lot of times you'll see sassafras in, you know, in clumps where multiple stems, and they are hard to kill. You know, they're one of the harder things to, to, to kill, kind of like tree of heaven, you know. In fact, you could treat them like tree of heaven. Mm -hmm. Same thing. Real fine. You could, you could paint a mask with these. Like a tall paw. Mm. So you can see, uh, you know, you start, you got to feel that they do the same thing. In fact, so paw paw, you know, 25 years ago I was taught it's a site indicator species. It means, you know, where you see paw paw growing, you got good fertile soil, which is true. A lot of times they'd be down in your valleys and places with good soil. Very fire intolerant. So historically they were kept to the, the wet, you know, the wet spots that just really didn't uh, burn that often. So you'd see them down in your valley floors, just like this little ravine here. Now you see pawpaw all over. It's marching up. I mean, it's marching up in a big way. In fact, some places it's just thick as can be, take over whole hillsides. You can see right there, see this, uh, see that tree that's about six inches in diameter? That's a pawpaw too. They get, they get pretty big. Do they have big leaves? Um, yes. Like yes. Yeah, they, I was trying to remember. Yeah, here it is. Sure. There you go. When you walk into a pawpaw stand in the spring or summer, it's like being in a, a jungle. You know, it's, there's something about it, like you just left the hardwoods and you're standing in a in a jungle, especially a you know a dense stand when you're underneath. Having said that, I think out of all the years, I've been able to eat the fruit maybe twice. I think the coons get them bef way before they're even ripe, from my understanding. So you know. So but is huh? the fruit usually really high? Is that right? Uh, they're high. That's yeah. why I purchased. Yeah, but they, you know, I mean, the couple times that I was able to get them, they. You know, you shake the tree, they, they weren't like, you know, completely out of reach. Yet. But that's what I was told is the kings, you know, the animals get them before you can find them. They have a very short window being ripe. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I heard they're good. I yeah. can smell them when they're ripe. That's really? how I know. Is that what I got in front of my house? With all their, they're all, they look like, just like that, where they're all scattered together like that? Probably. Yeah. yeah. Right by the now mailbox what there on the other side. You can tell by that bud. That bud's a giveaway on that. Just, uh, How sharp it is. Yeah, and it's real, uh, yeah, it's it's real pliable. It's almost like a, a wet um, paintbrush, yeah. you know, a fine paintbrush or something like that. When would the tree bear fruit? Like what age around, do you think? I'm not sure about Sep that. September. As far as uh, timing goes? Uh, yeah. Around here, September. Yeah, okay. And I'm not sure how old they'd have to be. You know, but uh, but they get they get surprisingly big and they can be dense. Um, fire There's a couple burns and you start seeing them retreat. You know, they they're not very fire tolerant. They're thin bark, they're smooth bark. You can see you got some box elder growing along with them. You know, and if you just let that go, you know, it'll start marching and expanding. There's a spot in the middle of this uh, nature preserve way off trail uh it's on the way to a, a prairie that we've been working on but it is just dense with pawpaw yeah, yeah. just dense yeah hmm. yeah hmm. yeah and it's it's a native it's neat it's wildlife food but uh it'll it can be invasive if you're trying to manage for other trees so and for cinnamon tree, yeah, 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 it is. And that one's got, you can look up there, you got persimmons on there. Yeah, using all the clues you can in the winter time. It's hard. It, yeah, it can be pretty challenging. Those are the ones where you cut the fruit and look at it. Yeah, it was a spoon. Say something, I'm recording. <laughs> okay, okay. I just wanted to point out this uh, persimmon tree right here. Um, 
You know, I remember from tree ID class, I had written out alligator skin bark. Yep. You know, and, and it really does look like that a lot of times. Um, you can look up there and you can see some, there's some persimmons still hanging up there. So, you know, there's two clues right there. You look right here and you got raccoon crab full of persimmon <laughs> seeds. Isn't that amazing? You just started, uh, you started adding those clues up and, you know, oh, yep, definitely persimmon. You know, so, but uh, yeah, yep, that's it. And it's kind of interesting. A lot of times in the forest when you see a single tree like this, they seem like they don't, it's rare that you have them produce a whole lot, you know, because... Uh, and a lot of times it won't be a single, you know, you'll have a half dozen or a dozen of them. And they'll be in the forest setting, and they just don't produce that often. Not compared to, like, a field edge tree, you know, that's always loaded. But sure enough, got some. So, yeah. And they're kind of, uh, they do like fertile soil. You rarely see them up on top of the bluffs or right over there. If you look right over there, so I had the same, uh, earlier I seen this tree right here. It looks like that cotton went down below the, mm -hmm. look at the butt, look at the branches up there. So, to my, and in fact, if you look at the base of that tree, it almost even looks like a flat wall. You know, and I, you know, I didn't get under there and start kicking around or anything, but, um, but I believe it's probably a cottonwood just by the characteristics. But you got this little shelf here, so you know you got a bunch of ash growing. Um, you got that cottonwood. You know, kind of got a. You, you got some species just right here that we're going to lose as soon as we walk up here. Right up here, we'll start walking into a true oak hickory forest with, uh, uh, you know, still got maple under it, and another couple species I'll point out. Um, but here's a native right here that is worth mentioning. This is called spice bush. And if you smell it, it really does smell kind of like sassafras. It smells good. Um, but it will take, I've seen places where this is just like bush honeysuckle. Mm. Just oh, dense. Thick, thick it of a spice bush. So it's invasive? It can be. So I don't want to smell if you can smell good. Alex. <laughs> <laughs> just for you. <laughs> try it. Uh, try it. You <laughs> it. Well, it smells, it's, it's scraped the bark a little if you need to. That's the, you know, I mean, it's Nothing characteristic. Nothing can penetrate this yeah. stuff, he knows. <laughs> yeah, that might be able to do it. <laughs> kind of like, uh, not like a sassafras. You know, there's a couple things like that. It's got a lot of dew on it, don't it? Well, it's got a lot of moisture, don't it? It does. I think uh, you can use the berries, possibly, as a spice in food. No kidding? Food. Is that uh, where the I name think. came from? The, uh, I, go ahead. I'm sorry. Yeah, I just remember, uh, I'm, I've seen it in Basin, where it was no different than bush honey stuff. This here stuff? Yes. Well, you yes. know where Gary here. Camp is probably right in. Right yeah. Yeah. And right there, That's right the behind it. It's just nothing but the honey, or uh, spice, spice bush. And the trail's going to be named Spice Bush. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that we put in. Yeah, that's good. That'll be Spice Bush Trail. <laughs> Yeah, I've cut it just yeah. There was no difference. Was that a quarter? Mm -hmm. This is a good spot to stop. So, all of a sudden we entered, you know, a predominantly white oak forest with some other things, sugar maple right here behind us. But we're really getting into the white oak. You know, some nice white oak in here. Um, let's see here. Just a, point one out. Yeah, here we go right here. This is probably your, your best example. Just that whitish grayish the transition. What's that? Why is it bark the bark transition? Um, you know, uh, the bark itself can be, as we walk up, you'll see, you know, in fact, you can see a bunch of bigger white oak as we go. They'll look, they'll all look different to some degree. Um, when they start getting big, you'll have those <laughs> vertical furls on it. You know, it's almost like a shag bark hickory in a sense, but, <laughs> you know, especially maple. as you get up there. It's usually you know. a little higher. Yeah, and they don't all look like that. You might have one with tight bark running the whole way. I mean, it's just, a, you know, it could be just a sight characteristic or, you know, the, the genotype of, of the, you know, from, from its parent plant. Sometimes maybe. a fungus can cause kind of a, a interesting yeah, color. Also. Um, but one thing to note, you know, we got, we've got this, 
white oak overstory. Look underneath. What do we got? Maple. 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 Look at this one. This one's a, this is a half horn bean. What'd you call it? It's called a half horn bean. Um, also ironwood. Know? Yeah, ironwood. Um, iron yeah, wood. exactly ironwood. That's a common name for it. But it'll it'll do this. It'll do this, and it, and it actually can be a, it can be a medium size understory tree. It can be in the mid story. I've seen it, I've seen it that big, you know, a foot in diameter or so. But uh, a prolific cedar. I mean, look at it in here. So it's really cool it. looking fruit. Yeah, yeah, like a catkins, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, say you were doing a, a timber stand improvement contract here and, you know, you come into an area like this and you're just like, ah, oh, I just lost money here, you know, or, uh, you know, just a lot of cutting, a lot of cutting. And I've been in places where it was like this and there's no short way around it. You've got to uh, cut it, stump spray it. I mean, that's the best method i found. Cut it, stump spray it, and then, you know, try to run fire on it and keep it back. But yeah, so, you know, underneath this white oak stand, you're, you got hop horn beam occupying the forest floor, and then you look and you got maple and they right behind us. All these are maple trees. Um, so when you actually get to looking, you don't have you know almost zero oak regeneration. You know, and uh, and this is very typical. I mean, this is very typical of what's going on. Just these oaks aren't regenerating. Um, so what do you do? You try to re recreate conditions. You know, here's a, a dogwood, a gray dogwood. It's doing the same thing if you look. Here's one right here. Here's another one, another one, and it'll that'll form a thick stand too. So now all of a sudden you got hop horn beam, sugar maple, dogwood, and it's just gonna occupy this forest floor. And those oaks don't stand a chance to these oaks. You know, so what can they do? Can they can they persist for decades? Probably, unless, you know, we're getting a lot of oak die off. Uh, you know, so it depends on if, if uh, oak decline hits or oak wilt or uh, any number of diseases that are hitting them. But uh, usually what I look for in a stand, you got a, a white oak right here. You know, it's not exactly healthy, but, you know, it's pole size. It's called pole size timber. It's not big enough to harvest but it is above the forest floor, you know? So if I walk into a forest and I've got enough of these, I say, okay, you know, I've got some trees in there that are gonna be around for decades. I can work with them, you know? They're, they're not seedlings on the forest floor getting out-competed. They're not old, over-mature oaks that are getting ready to die out, you know? Unforeseen any environmental factors, storms, diseases, these should, this size class should be around for a while. So, uh, so when I see that, I say, okay, you know, in a sense, you got a safety factor. You know, if you don't have this size class and all you got is big mature oaks and you don't have any regeneration, you're on the clock. I mean, you're, you're really on the clock on trying to regenerate that stand before, before that seed source disappears. So um, the textbook example is to thin all this stuff out and start burning it. Um, it, it did work. It worked well for, you know, for a long time up until probably really 30 years ago when invasives started really hitting the landscape. That's when, that's when the textbook example, you might as well throw it out the window at this point in time. Um, but in here, I would still do, I would recommend that. I'd say thin, thin this stuff out, start burning it. See if you can get some oak regeneration. It's gonna take you 10 years before you start seeing it. You know, after probably three or four burn cycles, you're gonna to have to thin this stuff out at least once and a lot of it's gonna to try to come back, you know, so it's very, it's very labor intensive. You know, it really is. What's your time frame on burning? How often is it? Every two or three years is ideal if you can get it on there, but uh, it's a rarity to be able to hold a pattern that tight for very long. You know, a lot of times on bigger lands for a couple of reasons. Um, a lot of times it'll support it. You just got to make sure you got enough leaf litter there. Um, it's kind of interesting though. Oak has evolved with fire. So when, when the leaf in an oak forest, when the leaves hit the forest floor, they'll dry up and they'll curl, allow air to get in there. They'll dry out. A maple, 
Maple don't like fire. They'll lay flat and hold that moisture. That hop hornbeam will do the same thing. So not only you got this time crunch, you've got species that are, you know, evolved to suppress fire. And so getting into, you know, trying to run fire sometimes on, and this isn't even the worst of it. Bush honeysuckle is probably about the worst, you know, as far as if you got a dense, mature stain of bush honeysuckle, you can actually use it for a fire break and burn against it, you know, a lot of times. So, yeah, yeah, so you need uh, you need the fuel to carry the fire and, that, and then manpower in the right, right weather window, that's your limiting factors. But uh, in this case scenario, if you really opened it up, you'd want to burn it as, as often as you could, at least for three, four cycles, hold back, see what happens. If you don't like it, keep going. And then, you know, at some point, you just might have to, to plant. You know, if, if that's your, if it's your near property and, hey, I want oaks, they're not regenerating, let's, uh, I'm going to have to go buy some oak trees and start planting. What type of oak would you recommend? Would a black oak do better than these whites? No, um, no, I, you know, black oak, uh, what happened really in the, you know, here, not, here also, but not as much as you'd see it in, say, places in the Ozarks and stuff. They came in there and really harvested hard, almost clear cut the landscape, 1860 to 1930s in a lot of places, somewhere in that time frame. And when they came in, they wiped out the white oak and especially the shortleaf pine if you're over in Missouri. You know, they hit it hard. They built, the, you know, a lot of your, think of the big timbers, uh, think of the, some of the buildings in St. Louis that are just breaking timber. You know, a lot of that's shortleaf pine. So they wiped it out hit it hard and up up came this flush a new forest heavy on black oak all right so now we, we just skewed the species composition and that's that's what forestry is about you can do it uh, intentionally or unintentionally unintentionally but so now all of a sudden we took a lot of the, the the good you know white oak out and the pine in certain places well black oak come on strong then red oak black oak and they came on strong for about a hundred years and we're at the end of their life cycle right now so they're you know so a lot of times you're when you do see black oak they're they're at the end they're they're rotten a lot of times you know um, Black oak in general, they don't live as long as a white oak and they'll, they'll rot out quicker. You know, so from a timber standpoint, you want to harvest them. You don't want to let them get too big. You start losing, you know, on butt rot. So a lot of places like in Missouri, they'll, uh, you know, you're hitting all the red and black oak you can. You know, I've been on some contracts over there on Forest Service ground and we went in and giant red timber, um, scarlet, red, scarlet and red oak and black oak. but but big timber, it was uh, the Forest Service, the, 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 you know, the agent that I was in contact with, he goes, uh, he goes, you know, he goes, you got a real nice area. He goes, uh, nobody's been cutting in there since uh, they had a two-man crosscut saw. Oh. And I got in there and, you know, and it was over by like eh, Van Buren area, you know, between Poplar Bluff and Van Buren, but monster red oaks. And he goes, hit all those that you can. We were marking them and then tallying them, but he goes, Hit all of them you can, because if if you don't uh, if you don't take them, our our in-house crew is coming behind you, you contractors, and we're going to take them all. And that might sound you know you know terrible, right? But they said don't touch the pine. So here you had this some <coughs> nice shortleaf pine, and underneath you know old growth, and underneath that was white oak. It was nothing but white oak. So. The stage was set perfectly to basically wholesale this, re this black oak and red oak for another stand of white oak. The white oak was just like this maple is. Thick as dog hair and right to the bottom of the canopy, you know? So, so it's all, it all depends on what you got going, but black oak and red oak are usually a shorter lived, in my opinion, less desirable. You know, from a timber value, they're less valuable. Um, you need them in the mix, you know, they produce acorns at different times or I'm not saying, you know, and if you had an all white oak stand, you got to watch out too, because, you know, any kind of homogenous stand, you know, you're that much more susceptible to diseases and, but uh, that's kind of the timeline. We've, we harvested hard, it's come full circle, a lot of your black oaks, the mature ones, now they've regenerated since, so you'll have pole sized black oak, but 
by and large, a lot of your oak, black oak and red oak are getting to the end of their lifespan. Um, so it's a good time to shift it back to white oak. Um, you know, but but things have changed. You know, we got it. We've got invasives and we've got diseases that are hitting oaks. So that's when you might take a look at these maples and be like, I'm going to leave them, or at least where they're nice. You know, anybody got any opinions on that or any stories? You know, that or any observations? Are there any short leaf pines around here? Yes, there are. Where are they? Um, there's a couple of uh, so, so as far as uh, documented, you got Larue Pine Hills and places south of here. Um, Piney Creek Nature Preserve's got a, a, a stand. However, having said that, um, there's one in, on Salt Lake Point Nature Preserve out in the middle of nowhere that's uh, it's pretty unique. It's nothing huge, but it's persisting. And I know of a, I know of a, pers a private property near Fountain Creek close to Ambrier that uh, has two just beautiful shortleaf pines just growing up in their forest. And I cored them. They dated down to about 1920, early 1900s. And then I know of a property over in the Renault that has, a, you know, it's a post oak, black oak stand, so kind of harsher site, drier site, and a big monster old growth shortleaf pine. So we're getting, we're, they're here, but very rare. Why are there no cedars out here? <laughs> you guys cut them? <laughs> they're, they're usually thinned out. I did it. I saw. I've got pictures of them. <laughs> What's the reason of doing that? What's that? What's the reason of cutting them off? Well, you got the hill prairies up here, and this is, you know, an extension of them in a sense as far as being on the same property. So they're in direct, those hill prairies are getting overrun with cedars. And then you can't really make it out today just because it's so gray, but if you, you know, these, these knobs right across from us, these ridges, You'll see on the southwest slope, there's a couple spots. In fact, you can see it. You see all the cedar over there? You can make out some green there. Those, those were hill prairies and glades, and those cedars just come in full bore. So there's nothing against them. Like, I like having a mix of cedars in your forest, honestly. It just provides that backdrop, provides cover. But on the prairie standpoint, you know, they can be invasive. Over Missouri, they're taking over everything. So. Uh, so they don't have them here because Joanna's personally wiped a, a fair number of them out. She told Mike to take them out. <laughs> so, In the prairies, yes. I probably have taken a few out of the prairies, yeah. but not out of the woods. No. Yeah, and that's really your native evergreen, uh, eastern red cedar. Um, shortleaf pine is native to Illinois. They're not around like they used to be. Is it called shortleaf pine or is there another name for it? No, that's... Uh, Just shortleaf pine? Yeah, yeah, okay. yeah. yeah. And uh, so they're around on the landscape, very few. Very few. <laughs> you, buy those or? you can buy them. I like them, they're pretty neat. When they get mature, they kind of look like um, miniature ponderosa pine. You know? Yeah, they do. And, and just real big platy bark and, and they're native, yep. And you don't have to go far to pick them up over in Missouri. In fact, they're right along the bluffs of the Mississippi River, you know? So, so that's what I'm thinking happens. We're, they're coming over on birds or wind or, you know, something. Something's bringing them over. Like the woolly buckthorn, right? Yeah, very similar. Yep. Well, what's white oak family? Um, white oak has round lobes. Any, any white oak species in the white oak family has round lobes. This is the maple, obviously, but the red oak has pointy, pointy lobes. And that's how you differentiate between the two families, red oak or white oak. Here's a black oak, just a, a true black. Um, you can see it snapped off, which, you know, this guy's old. This guy's probably starting to get rotten and starting to get weak. He's, you know, he's, he's already obviously snapped now, but he's, he was at the end of his lifespan. You can see this bark, it almost looks like a, you know, not quite like a persimmon, but you start getting, you know, it's blocky. It's blocky. Kind of a black looking bark, but uh, one thing you can do with this, if you really want to see, it has each side, let's see if we can get it. The inside of that bark, if you start whittling on it, you can get a color that almost looks like pumpkin pie. Mm. 
it's just kind of real orange. You know, you're starting to pick it up there. Hmm. Let's try to see. Yeah, they yeah they're different. It's hard to tell, honestly. Like this one's to me, it's pretty pronounced, and you really I haven't gotten down into there. But uh, if you dig on that enough, you'll you know it's almost like you just took a little piece of a pumpkin pie and you know, took a spoonful out. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So that's how you know we're on in black oak like you know we're we're on a ridge top. The water's going both sides. This is a dry side relatively. Um, as we leave this area, we're gonna, the white oak transition into black oak, you know, as the site gets drier uh, and hotter. But uh, yeah, black oak right here, um, you know, at the end of its lifespan, it's not necessarily that huge. And when I say that, I'm not saying like a black oak can't get huge and stuff, because they can, but overall, they have a much shorter lifespan than the white oak. Um, they, you know, they, they start getting rotten quicker. This guy here, if you were doing a timber sale and he wasn't snapped off, even right now actually, you know, I didn't look, I didn't grade him or look at the backside, but you could you could take him in a timber sale. He's probably rotten that first, you know, six or seven foot down from that snap is where you'd probably get into clean lumber. But uh, and it has to be eight foot long. Is that what you said? Usually, yep, yep, eight foot, especially for black. If you got white oak. And it's decent, you go a little shorter as they use them for barrel staves. I see. Um, and when you say this is not that old, how old would you think that one is? Roughly, if you're just going to guess. You know, I've put my foot in my mouth too many times on that time. Give or take a hundred years. And, yeah, <laughs> and, and here's why, because uh, depending on where you're at, but you know, the Ozarks, I really like working over there uh, for this factor. You can have a tree that's six inches mm -hmm. and be 75 years old, just stunted, you know, and it's just that harsh and slow growing. Because of the, the ground or the soil. Because of the ground and soil. And you'll have a tree right next to it that's, <coughs> you know, a foot and a half, two foot diameter, and they'll be the same age. And the reason is because it's just so stunted and there's competition, one tree got the advantage and the other one didn't. And I remember, you know, doing a lot of timber stand improvement here. And then I'd always keep jobs in Missouri too. And uh, when I'd go back and forth jobs, you had to shift gears mentally because even though you're dealing with the same species for the most part, hmm. it's it's so different. But I remember doing a timber uh, doing a timber stand improvement over there in Missouri. And you know, here if you got a white oak sapling, it's like gold, almost no matter what it looks like, right? Oh, nice white oak, I'm keeping it over there. You know, I thinned out the usual suspects and I left, you know, there's some nice, nice oak in there. Sapling, small diameter. And the district forester over there is like, you know, hey, come back in here and thin out some of these small oaks. And I was, you know, I, you know, I met him out there and, and heard him out and he's like, no, look how stunted they are. They'll never, they'll never amount to anything. And he was right. And you get to look in and there's characteristic, you tell it's just, they were stunted. And so it was better off just to cut them at ground level and let them re-sprout. Hmm. Um, so, so you can never tell how old something is without an increment bore and going ahead and, and coring it. And getting drilling into and it. And drilling into it, yep. And then once you, could you walk us through when you actually do a drill into a tree? Could you tell us about that yeah. process? Yeah. Well, you determine the age and that. The, uh, if you get a good increment bore, there's two, three hundred bucks a pop and, uh, you don't know how many of them, especially working in the Ozarks, that you're... Well, first of all, it's kind of like a gun barrel. You get that thing as clean as can be, right? Okay. And then you uh, you wax it up, you oil it up. At the end of the day, you, you clean it just like you do your favorite rifle. All right. And then when you go to bore into a hardwood grown on a ridge top, you know, you're, you get it going, first of all, you're pushing as hard as you can. Maybe it makes like, is it, is it got electrical power? Or no, you, you hand one, hand, you know, the, hand yeah, the ones I've done, but you, you, you push on it and finally get it going. And then, you know, being over in the Ozarks, I mean, you're, you're out in the middle of nowhere, it's just like this, but only it's every direction, you know, mm -hmm. and you start turning that thing and it lets out like an injured animal sound, first of all, and it's loud and you just don't know what's coming up. You know, you're, you're doing it at the same time you're looking for whatever. But, uh, but yeah, you, you, uh, you know, you bore to what you think is the center of the tree. 
how do you you know you just kind of get feel for it? You yeah, get your standard increment bores, you know, a foot and a half maybe. You know, and when you say increment board, is this something you're going to measure that on? Then? Well, okay, I, sorry, I'll back up. It's basically a, like an aluminum arrow with a drill bit tip, hollow in the center, and you, you go to the center. You know, you aim your best to the center of the tree. And as soon as you think you're there, or you might bottom it out, because like I said, it's, and it's got a, you know it's got a metal handle, and it all slides together and fits on your on your belt. But okay. uh, but as soon as you got in the center, you back her up as quickly. If you stop in there in that tree, it'll suck tight on you. And when you go to go again, you'll pop it and you'll you leave that bit sitting in the tree. And there's 200 bucks right off the bat. <laughs> I don't do it so much around here because you don't need to. We're not required. But okay. when I was writing plans a lot in the Ozarks, we had to you know core a lot of trees. Like every so many plots, you had <laughs> to core. And then does that show the rings? Or it what does. And shows? so you 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 bring it out, and it basically uh, you know it's a quarter of the tree rings, and you can count. And you how know, big a round is that? It's just a little, just, little uh, diameter of a pencil, a little bit smaller than that. That's Yep. Well, now, and you know, and so for my master's degree over in, in North Arkansas, I cut down a hundred old growth shortleaf pine, right? You know, over 5,000 acres, so it wasn't like it was, uh, you know, a hundred on, on 10 acres. You yeah. know, no, nobody knew the difference, but we were looking for, we were looking for fire scars in the tree rings. And so when you cut down a tree and look at those tree rings, you got the whole picture, right? <clears throat> when you're doing an increment bore, you just got a little snapshot of what's okay. going on. It'll tell you your age as long as you hit the pith, but that's about all the information. You're red oak family, here's a couple northern red oaks, these large ones, also red oak family. And if you look, that's what I was up. always taught and it sticks in my mind on a mature northern red oak, you see those vertical striations up there? You know, think ski slopes down the side of the mountain, fresh powder, you know, and it won't, those won't show up on a black oak. Yeah, sometimes they can look very close and you get in there with your pocket knife and you're looking for that pumpkin pie or you're, you're doing whatever you need to do or looking at the acorns. But uh, in this case, and this, this holds true, not all the time, but most of the time, but a, a mature northern red will have those vertical striations. You know, so, and those are mature by, by all means. You can see, you know, you're starting to get some dieback up there, uh, over there also. Uh, nice trees, you know, in a nature preserve setting. Absolutely good wildlife, good seed value, good regeneration. For harvest, and, and mature, and she's mature, and from that point on, you're just going to get be getting rot coming in that, that uh, broken limb right there. So. When you say good regeneration properties, regenerative properties, do you mean that they proliferate quicker or that they're more... Just seed source. You know, you've got a seed source there by leaving them. Okay, more than like a black oak though? Well, no, not necessarily. Oh, I mean, they're okay. going to throw similarly, but, uh, you know, like that guy there, he's gone. He's not going to produce anything, even if he lives. But this guy here is probably... You just mean that they have, a lot, essentially, in the layman's terms, like they have a lot of seeds. Yeah, he's gonna okay. he's gonna from a land from a on a nature preserve setting. Yeah. And you know, and some fires running through if you're managing it, you might still be able to get some natural regeneration out of yeah. it. But he is on the clock. I mean he's he's big, he's getting old, he's starting to die back. Um, but we would have already seen some or maybe you're saying the same thing. <laughs> no, like same thing. Is there can we tell anything? Um, when we know right find now? Uh, well, I'm not a He's old. Question, you know? So here's maple. Um, right here. Looks like. Here we go. Right here. Yeah, here's a little red oak seedling. You know, out of, out of multiple red oak trees right here. So is that a, is that a red oak there too? Oh, let's see where he at. Right here. He kind of looks inches. like one. Yeah. That bigger one there. It's they, not they regenerating like they, you know, they're not regenerating. You know, so, and this is very typical. Like I said, you might see a few. Mm -hmm. They're very susceptible at that stage. You need thousands to regenerate. You need thousands of them per acre. Um, when you start getting them to this stage, obviously you don't need as many. You know, so the trick is... 
is to first get any regeneration, you know, acorn germination. And when you got them, you know, that's when you, when you start getting them, that's when you want to lay off your burning. You want to give them a window where they can start growing, you know. So, uh, so we, it's, we got a real problem regenerating oaks. And it's no, you know, it's, it's uh, people are ringing the bells pretty loudly to try to avert a situation where you're just going to have to plant because you're not, you know, you're not getting that natural regeneration. So. Well, there's one at least. Yeah, yeah, yeah. right. He'll survive till deer comes, gets hungry, and, oh, you know. No, don't do that. <laughs> um, there's lichens right here. Black oaks really, at least right here, you know, they tend to have that. And that could be the fact they're darker and they heat up a little bit warmer and it's favorable conditions, you know, whatever environmental factor that's. Uh, it's like a fungus? Yeah, yeah. It won't hurt them. You know, it's, uh, it's not a parasitic fungus at all. It's just uh, mm. white. Yeah, you've yeah, you got some nice black oaks in here. We're certain, you know, here's a little pocket of red oaks. You can see them up there. So, so but I'd say it's a shag bark hickory. Just, uh, you're starting yeah. to get, you know, it's not like a mature one. It's just shaggy all over the place. But if you look on the side of it there, you can start seeing where he's just developing uh, that bark, you know, characteristic. Um, if you're not sure, you could hunt. Uh, you could hunt it down. Usually, if it's not shag bark, it's either uh, which is usually very obvious. I'd still say he's a shag bark. He's starting to get those characteristics. But mocker nut hickory or pig nut hickory are the two other hickories that are common around here. Uh, for the most part, mocker nut. You know, I'm so used to like say doing uh, doing an inventory, especially if I'm marking timber or something. All the hickories go together. You know, so you really don't have to differentiate. Um, but, uh, you know, uh, shag bark is pretty obvious. A bitter nut hickory, mm -hmm. and I haven't seen one of those, but it's very different than the other hickories. Um, the buds are not, the buds are like a pawpaw bud, almost like that paintbrush I was telling you about, where, where your standard hickories, mock nut, uh, shag bark, and pig nut, they've got just a, you know, a big bud that's just hard and, you know, um, well, here it is right here. Let's go. Here you go. You know, very different than, you know, just a hard bud, very different than like a bitter nut hickory. But a bitter nut hickory you're going to find growing down in the bottom, usually. It's a bottom one species. So, we didn't touch overall. Hickory seem to be doing better than oaks. You know, in a lot of forests, you'll see. You know, younger hickory trees, saplings, pole size. They don't seem to be getting hit like uh, like oaks right now. But you can see that's all hop horn beam right here. You know, it's a it's a transition. 20 years ago, that probably it might have been here to some degree, but it certainly wasn't like this. So, <clears throat> well, we're almost to the top. One the standards. This is still fertile as all get out. But we're going to Southern Illinois. Right here, we're at the top of the ridge. It's dry here. This is some of your harshest sites you're gonna find. And so, you know, you start picking up on the hickory, the black oak, um, red buds, yes. There you go, I overlooked those. Here's an understory red bud there. In some places, they're a dime a dozen, you know, they can be. Um, do they do well in the same? Like under the... They do. Um, you know, persisting for long. They do like some sunlight. Okay. You know, they, they're not quite like a maple that can just go decades without real sun. They do like some sunlight. They also don't like full sun. But yeah, we're at a, we're at a, at a much drier site than we were where we started. So mm -hmm. black oak are going to be predominant. <laughs> Post oak and hickory. And then you'll get out to, you know, we would have cedars all along here if it wasn't for Joanne. Um, <laughs> what else? Uh, there's blackjack oak, which is about the, the scrappiest of the oak species we got here. You know, when I say scrappy, they're used to growing on just dry, harsh sites. Which oak? Um, uh, the blackjack. And what about pin oaks? 
We haven't talked a lot about them. Well, they're, you know, they're originally a bottom one species. Oh, they are. They are. Okay. Um, people have, you know, planted them all over, and they actually do pretty well in a lot of places. You know, people's yards, old mm -hmm. fields. Um, mm -hmm. You know, um, so you see them a lot more places <coughs> now than you used to, but in a natural setting, they're bottom one hardwood. Oh, yeah. Getting the galls really bad. Though. Yeah, that's right. They are. It's killing them. It is. Yeah. I'm sorry. What did you say? Galls. Oh. Oh. Those little round things. Oh, oh yes. Yeah. Right. Yeah. The wasps. That's right. But wasp the weird thing is, is I saw like shingles in the woods with the galls. They'll have that too. That's correct. So you are right. Are they only hitting certain? Um, uh, shingle oak and pin oak are the only okay. ones that I've seen. Because I was surprised to see that. Okay. Yep, yep, yep. They'll be on shingle oak just the same. And that's one tree too I haven't seen here. Uh, shingle oak, it's the only oak we have around here that doesn't have a an oak leaf. It's more just a standard, um, you know, lance type leaf to it. Um, field edge tree, you know, it's a field edge oak. That's where you see them. There's they, a lot of uh, Fort Cascades here. Yeah, yeah, they're, they're kind of a. They're a lesser oak. I mean, yeah, they throw acorns, but um, they rarely ever get to be like any kind of a gray in stature. You know, um, they're rarely like a lumber tree, um, but they do proliferate, especially along field edges. We haven't seen any cherry trees either. No, you're right. Why is that? I'm sure there's got to be some. Joanne. Yeah. No. <laughs> <laughs> Joanne. Yeah. Joanne. Yeah. 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 you heard you hit, they took on that. I did not take any Terry trees. Terry's all right. Yeah, we'll see some of them. I'm sure there's some of them around. Uh, they're, they're slow growing, long lived oak, like drier sites. And it's kind of interesting when you get out to like Hecker and start heading uh, east of here, you get into those post oak flats, they call it. But you know, you're not on a ridge top. You're not, sometimes you're not even in places you think would be dry. In fact, they can hold water, but you get jet monster post oaks you know, out in the middle of the flats. You know, mm. it's soil mm. quality. Are they susceptible mm. to disease as well? Not as bad as so right. too white. Oak, yep. mm. So if you wanted to read forest, post oak would be a good choice? Yeah, you could throw them in there. You know, if they're, they're super slow growing, mm -hmm. you know, I'd do some, if it's a decent site, you know, you do some burrs and, and some white and some post in there, sure, you can mix them in there, but. And generally, they're found in your harsher sides, you know. So we we should be able to see some up here. We'll take a walk to the prairie, which is this right there, and then we'll uh, call it done, and everybody.